I'm excited that this morning we're going to be continuing the series that we started last week, Both And. Um, and this, this is a, a series that considers the fact, as Catherine uh, prayed for us earlier today, that we live in a nation, in a world that feels very fractured. That feels like people, and again, as I might just keep quote, quoting Catherine for a moment, um, last week, I love this, she said, we are addicted to extreme polarities. We love to go to extremes because we can feel safe and comfortable there and be surrounded with voices and people that agree with us. And yet, and yet Jesus seems to come right into the midst of that either or way of living and offer up something different, something that we are calling as a series both and. And this morning we're going to look at both good and evil and We're going to begin by considering a passage of scripture from the book of Romans that Paul writes to the church of Rome as instruction for how Christians should live with one another and those around them. So let me invite you to read with me from Romans chapter 12. Let love be genuine. Hate what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lag in zeal. Be ardent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in suffering. Persevere in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Extend hospitality to strangers. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. No, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. For by doing this, you will heap burning coals on their heads. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Oh God, open our hearts and our minds to you, to your holy and living word. Let us receive it in such a way that we would be formed by you and for your glory. And so, God, I pray that in these moments you would speak through me, and if need be, in spite of me, so that your word alone would be heard this morning. Amen. So we've all been there, and actually with the rain this morning, I'm guessing a lot of us were there again just recently, just this morning. You're driving along the road, maybe one of your favorite songs has come on and you're singing along to it, or you're, you're thinking with some excitement about where you're going or what's next, and seemingly out of nowhere, here they come, other drivers. <laughs> and maybe, maybe they're just driving way too slow to be in the left lane, or maybe they've cut you off Or maybe you can't even get all the way into the turn lane because the person in front of you needs three car lengths between them and the car in front of them. Whatever it is that's happening, somebody, one of those other drivers, is getting in the way. We've all been there. And then after our hands have have batted the steering wheel a little bit and our eyes are done rolling in our heads, we look again at their car and that's when we notice it. Yeah. Yeah, right? Or maybe, maybe it's a a cultural or a social statement that really just ruffles our feathers a little bit. Or maybe it's a political statement or a party or a, a candidate. But whatever it is, we begin to see something on that car that makes us understand, makes us realize, well, yeah, 
Of course they cut me off. Of course they're driving too slow. Of course they're taking up too much space in the turn lane because, well, right? (laughs) The point is, separation is like a warm blanket that we wrap around ourselves. Division, declaring and naming and even celebrating the things that divide us makes us feel good, safe, comfortable, and sometimes righteous. Our differences are things that we recognize amongst one another often and easily, and and wherever you come down on that age-old question, is it nature or is it nurture, we are indeed a very tribal people. Recognition about the things that draw us closer together and of the things that push us away from one another is a big part of who we are and how we interact. And I want to be clear right from the start, I'm not going to stand up here today and say that it's all bad. Part of what I've been thinking about around these differences and the ways that they affect our interactions is the time that I lived in New York for several years when, when many of my friends there, like I am, were invested not just in college basketball, but specifically Duke and UNC college basketball. And so for years, whenever those big matchups would take place between those two teams, we would find ourselves on the Upper West Side at this little, well, it wasn't super little, but this wonderful North Carolina-style barbecue joint called Brother Jimmy's. And for any Duke and UNC game, that place was packed with Duke and UNC fans cheering and, and groaning at times and egging one another on. And of course, I I went to Duke, and so some of my closest friends there in New York were also Duke fans, but actually most of them were pretty strong UNC fans. And so we would get together, and we would just rib each other throughout the night. And there were also people that we worked together, or friends of friends who would come, and even though I didn't really know them that well, and even if they were rooting for UNC, that sort of shared fun experience would just bring us together, no matter who they cheered for, and no matter who won. It was usually Duke, but no matter who won. (laughs) My point is that noticing the differences that are between us are not always an inherently bad thing. Sometimes, in fact, those differences are actually behind the building of community. As Christians, as, as a church, we often think about the biblical description and the biblical imperative that we be not simply a collection of people who get together sometimes and believe stuff together, but that we live in such a way that we rely on one another, rely, in fact, on our differences, and we become the body of Christ together. And that's a body that functions because of the diversity of its parts, But so often, the differences that we find ourselves focusing on, the ones we give importance to, can have the opposite effect. Sometimes the labels we notice, the labels we assign, separate us from one another. And sometimes we find that we are wielding those differences so that we can make ourselves feel different, so that we can understand who others are and who in turn we are where we stand. And perhaps most harmful are those labels of good and evil. Whether they are used directly or whether that is a part of the understanding, it's sort of an undercurrent of another label used to separate, separate who is good and who is evil. My friends, those labels are dangerous. And I I don't mean that we just always flip them around, that they are given lightly. But I do want to say this morning that as followers of Jesus, we don't get to simply rest on them. We don't get to make it that easy. Because Jesus responds to good and evil very differently than we might prefer. 
throughout his ministry, the, the upstanding religious authorities of the faith that he was born into and grew up in, they are the ones that seem to get the brunt of his frustration. And the people who had been cast out, excluded by the very law of that same faith because it said they were unclean, They seem to be the ones who get his incredible patience and compassion more than any. Even in the the terrible experience of his crucifixion, Jesus does not condemn those who nail him to the cross, but prays for their forgiveness. And as he is mocked by the soldiers and then by one of the others being crucified alongside him, It was the other criminal who recognizes Jesus for who he is. It's a criminal on a cross who says he deserves to be there, to whom Jesus says, today you will be with me in paradise. And even those that we might say, well, those are some good guys, right? Even among those that walked with Jesus, we know it just was never that simple. Even Peter, think about with me for a moment, Matthew 16, where Peter declares, as Jesus asked, who do people say that I am? Who do you say that I am? And then Peter says, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. To which Jesus excitedly replies, Blessed are you, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter. And on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I mean, that's good, right? That's exciting, that's powerful, the rock on which the church will be built. But it's Peter. And so it only takes him three verses to stick his foot in his mouth and for Jesus to reply just another verse later, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. The rock on which Jesus will build his church was also the rock that sometimes was a stumbling block. You see, there is a complexity to good and evil beyond the simple labels we'd prefer beyond dismissal or welcome. And Jesus, Jesus not only pushes against them, I believe he seeks out opportunities to do so. One more story about Jesus. In the fourth chapter of John, Jesus travels from Judea to Galilee. And on the way, he comes to a Samaritan city called Sychar, See, he's tired from his journey, and so he's resting there at a well when a Samaritan woman comes by. And he asks her, as she begins to draw water for herself, to give him a drink. And she replies, How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? And the passage continues, offers us this little aside. Most translations put it in parentheses. Just a a quick note for you. It says this, Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. Now, I want to tell you this morning, that is just a delightful understatement. (laughs) Because the Jewish and Samaritan people were not just folks who didn't like to share. They were enemies. And I mean enemies for centuries. The anger and hatred between them had been festering, and there were fresh hostilities, including the Jews destroying the Samaritan temple and territory, and the Samaritans, even just around the time of Jesus' birth, defiling the temple in Jerusalem. They were enemies, and much of it stemmed from both sides believing that the other was actively profaning the religion from which they both came. I am sure that the labels of good and evil were applied as they considered one another amongst themselves. And yet, Jesus, there at the well, rises above the social and religious restrictions and shares with this Samaritan woman and then with her people that he is the Messiah. And he offers to them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. 
It's a beautiful moment, isn't it? It's a beautiful moment, and it's, and it's one that leads to, to many Samaritans believing in the Son of God and Jesus. But I'm particularly struck this morning by the one that happens just before it. You see, the, the beginning of the story is not Jesus at the well. The beginning of the story is Jesus in Judea getting ready to travel to Galilee. And verse 4 says this, Jesus had to go through Samaria. Had to. But the thing is, the necessity, it's not geographical. I mean, it wasn't a shortcut. In fact, it's really out of the way. It would be like saying, hey, after worship, let's go to Ocala together. And on the way, we have to go to Jacksonville. It doesn't make sense. Because the necessity was that moment at the well. The necessity was his time with a woman that Jesus' people believed to be their enemy. Jesus had to go to Samaria because he had to break through the simple ideas of good and evil that separated them from one another. You see, as Christians, there is this complexity in our understanding of good and evil, and it is revealed to us in Jesus, and it needs to change the ways we understand them and use them. Because differences are simple. Separation is a warm blanket that we wrap around ourselves. Division, declaring, and, and naming, and even celebrating the things that divide us make us feel good. Safe, comfortable, and sometimes righteous. And that is definitely true with the labels of good and evil. Because, well, let's be honest. <laughs> when we're the ones who get to determine and declare and name who is good and who is evil, you won't need too many guesses to find out which column we put ourselves in. Because if we get to set those boundaries, we get to make sure that we're the good guys and gals and that our enemies are the evil ones. And that opens us up to all sorts of justifications and, of course, problems. But the thing is, not only are those boundaries things that Jesus spends a whole lot of time tearing down, but he goes out of his way to do so. That is the unique way that God meets us in the midst of good and evil, as you and I, as all of us and all people, wrestle with them both. In other words, the way we understand good and evil is complex, not, not because it's hard to know who is good and who is evil, as if it's a simple making an either-or distinction, but that we are, each of us, capable of both good and evil. I'm reminded of a, a quote from the author and Nobel Prize winner Alexander Solzhenitsyn. He was a prisoner for nearly a decade in a Russian gulag, and on this subject, as he reflected on his experiences, this is what he had to say. If only there were evil people somewhere insidiously committing evil deeds, and it were necessary only to separate them from the rest of us and destroy them. But the line dividing good and evil cuts through the heart of every human being. And who is willing to destroy a piece of his own heart? We struggle, we succeed, we fail, we do good, we do evil. Our hearts, our lives, my friends, we are capable of both. And to be sure, we'd prefer to live as if there was an easier way. If only we could defeat those who are evil, cast them aside, separate them from us. But there are no simple separating lines drawn, except when we're the ones drawing them. The truth is the line between good and evil runs through each and every one of us. 
Which is why Paul's instruction for us from Romans doesn't shy away from speaking about that ongoing struggle between good and evil. We are surrounded by it, to be sure, but also we know it isn't just going on elsewhere or just in other people. In fact, the early invitation in our passage this morning to hate what is evil, hold fast to what is good, may seem like it pushes us right back to that simpler understanding. There's good, there's evil, pick one. But I'm, I'm struck by Paul's literal wrapping of that phrase with love. Right before he says, hate what is evil, hold fast to what is good, he says, let love be genuine. And right after he says those things, he says, love one another with mutual affection. I mean, it seems to me that in the midst of trying to discern and hold fast to the good and to hate the evil, we also need to be living lives of love, not dismissal. And as the passage continues, Paul repeatedly returns to the call to respond differently to evil. Just in the last verses, he says these things. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Never avenge yourselves. If your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. And do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Again and again, Paul challenges us to respond differently to evil. And we might prefer to see evil as justifying more of the same. I mean, let's be honest, they started it, has been a pretty good excuse for us most of our lives. And yet, here is something different. We respond to evil not with more evil, but with good. Because that's what it is to follow Jesus. And because the struggle between good and evil is not an us versus them kind of thing, but is in fact forever going on in each of our own lives. It would be simpler if we could just believe that we're good and those that disagree with us, those that believe differently than us, Those that behave differently. Well, look, take your pick. You could name whatever you want. But the bottom line is, the other is evil. And that's just a trap that we fall into. Our own stumbling block. As we look for ways to distinguish ourselves, especially from those who have wronged us. But it's just not that simple. And I think we should say, Praise God that it's not just that simple. Because instead, through the, through the gift of God's grace, we have been set free. And given the freedom to choose goodness, to choose God. And we recognize that it's that same freedom that, in our brokenness, means sometimes we choose evil. And so, Paul calls us to recognize that struggle in ourselves and in others. To know that the line between good and evil doesn't separate people, but runs through the heart of every one of us. And we are called to respond with love, to respond with good even when evil is being perpetrated, just as God has responded to us, comes and finds us when we're lost. Because if grace can save me, if we believe as Scripture tells us that grace is sufficient, then it is sufficient for all of us and for all people. Which means no one is beyond God's power and beyond God's love to forgive. It would be easier if we could treat good and evil as some kind of either-or distinction. What category do you fall into? What category do the people around you? The other driver who is making you crazy, what category are they in? What about your bully, that politician, our enemies? 
It would make things simpler. You're either good or evil. And I think that's why we're so quick to use those labels. But when we begin to recognize that each of us are in the midst of that struggle, that the line dividing good and evil cuts through the heart of every human being, that the both and of it is right there happening in our own lives, then we can let go of that simplicity and begin to live faithfully instead. Let me just offer one more thought. I believe that there are some of you here this morning that need to hear that you are not altogether good. (laughs) That you have not, through your goodness, earned God's love because God was giving it to you before and during and after, and praise God for that. And I believe some of you here this morning need to hear that you are not altogether evil. That you have not gotten so lost that grace cannot reach you or is not sufficient. You see, we are all, each of us, capable of both good and evil. And Jesus chooses to meet us right there. And that means that nothing will ever separate us from God's love. Nothing will ever separate us from Jesus who will come and meet us there at the well, who will welcome us to paradise, who has come so that you and I, who struggle with good and evil, so that you and I might have life and have it abundantly. Amen. Would you pray with me? Oh God, let us rest in your love. Not in our goodness, but in yours. Not even in our own faithfulness, but in yours. Let us rest in the incredible, wonderful gift of your grace. And to know that even as we struggle in our own lives to do the things we want to do and stop doing the things we don't want to, even as we struggle as creations that are both good and evil. Let us know your love there in the midst of it. And let us know that love and that peace. Amen.